Yeah, I mean, I've been mostly in, in crypto spaces. This whole war thing took me on a different path, but, uh, you know, I'm still mostly in finance spaces and what's going on following closely, what's happening with Bitcoin, you know, um, and everything else and, and ecosystem, NFTs. And I've been speaking on uh, Mari's other spaces, um, more the DGEN space, let's say, oh, with, wow. round okay. with the round table. <laughs> So, so I, I guess we don't qualify. I go into the nitty gritty. <laughs> we don't qualify as the DGEN space. We do like to go into the nitty gritty, but uh, I, I, I guess we'll time will tell whether it's DGEN uh, space or not. Um, but uh, but yeah, cool, very cool. We're gonna um, you know the show structure today. We're gonna do twenty minute, uh, approximately twenty minute recap of some crypto news. Uh, then we'll talk about the topic, which is about DeFi specifically, uh, and then we're gonna end with um, you know a fifteen minute uh, of, of the project Gorilla DeFi. So Gorilla DeFi, thank you. Welcome to the space. Uh, we look forward to Q and A afterwards, and um, if you want to jump in on any of these topics, of course, please feel free to do so. Um, Garrett, I might start with you. Um, it would be great to just get a sense of the recap of some news. There's been a lot of crypto spaces, a lot of conversations, uh, but yeah, I'd love to hear uh, what the latest is uh, on your thoughts. Yeah, yeah, and thanks for having me. I appreciate it. So, so really, what we've seen is uh, Bitcoin obviously continuing to see selling after the spot ETF. So we topped out around that forty nine thousand level. We kind of bottomed out today just around that thirty eight thousand support, which is again a pretty big sell off from the recent highs. But again, we are or we did hit key support today. So so I'm looking to watch this 38,000 level. I do think we could bounce back to 40 or just above 40,000. Uh, but again, the 38,000 level is the level to watch at this point in time. But yeah, it's been, it's been a wild ride. We've seen the altcoins really come in. I mean, if you look at prices of, of things like Avalanche, Avalanche was $50 not that long ago. We're going back to just mid-December. And today it hit a low of around $27. So it's really been a pretty steep decline from kind of these excitement uh, pushes on the altcoins. And then, and then really cat beating the catalyst for the continuation was the Bitcoin spot ETF. I do think, by the way, that... Um, you know, if 38,000 can hold, we can retest those highs. But if 38,000 gives way, 30,000 is the next level on the charts. Yeah, so, and in terms of the market participants, um, and I'm going to get all the rest of the folks in, but in terms of looking at how market participants are seeing this, uh, you know, this is definitely one of the outcomes people predicted, right? It was kind of like one of the two binaries, right? So I think you go uh, up or down, um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's in some ways not surprising for, for long-term market participants. What do you think is some of the drivers? Yeah, break it down. Yeah, so I, um, what are you, how are you seeing some of the fund flows? And yeah, so definitely GBTC has been a, a culprit of a lot of the selling pressure, but but it's really important for people to just understand that this is a lot of this is human psychology, and and you only have to go back to every basically major pivot top in the charts. Like you go back to 2017, that was the the high was literally put in on the excitement and when the futures debuted, so the Bitcoin futures, and then the first top in 2021 in April when we reached 65,000 was. Put in when the hype of the of Coinbase IPO came out, right? IPO, the Coinbase IPO was released, and that hype leading into it then caused a sell off to thirty thousand. We then charged right back up, only to put in the top uh, at sixty nine thousand when the the ETF for the futures was released. So, so there's this kind of it's 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 very psychological how you know any asset class is driven by greed and fear, and you know you have the FOMO of oh my goodness this big news event is coming, it's going to be the the game changer, right? I mean, how many times do we hear that game changer? Um, and so people just flood in. They push things up to kind of, uh, you know, a little bit short term overbought. And then there's a letdown effect following that. And I think that's really what we're seeing here is just that letdown. And I still think the spot ETF is a huge win for crypto as a whole. It's just, you know, price just went a little too far too fast on that hype. And it just has to kind of, you know, digest that move until it can start going up again. Sounds good. Um, Marshall, um, I kind of want to go to, to you, um, or you or Seraphim. What do you think of what some of the things Gareth has just been talking about? Yeah, it's interesting. You know, historically, <clears throat> throughout my time in, in Bitcoin in general, Bitcoin's always kind of been the, the, the rising tide that either lifts or sinks ships. And, you know, if we're looking at like a 24-hour percentage change against Bitcoin, you're seeing Ethereum down 3%, BNB down 2%. You know, mo most of the, the large cap uh, all coins are down against Bitcoin, and and I think you'll continue to see that until the grayscale um, pivot, you might say, is is over. Um, so yeah, I, I don't have anything else to add. Uh, outside of that, mining stocks are getting absolutely crushed. Um, some of that has to do with the, the ETF uh, sell off, and some of it has to do with uh, declining economics as the halving comes. But uh, yeah, net net, all the same. 
Yeah, can you talk a little bit more about what we expect to see in the halvings? And there's a lot of talks about, oh, in the in previous halvings, you know, we, this is what Bitcoin has done. Um, what is your opinion about how, I mean, obviously every situation is slightly different. Um, halvings can be forecasted well, well in advance. I mean, you know, through, through the life of 21 million Bitcoins. But um, what's your opinion about how that's going to impact things in this, in this particular case? Yeah, you know, I, I think we're seeing a similar trend. Um, it, it's just a... Um, the in the mining sector specifically you're not going to see a big washout in general simply because most of these large miners now have a war chest of of cash at their disposal you know marathon's sitting on a couple hundred million so bad actors I'm not saying marathon's a bad actor but in general people who are poor practitioners of mining usually get rinsed out just before or just after the halving but now that uh, good and bad miners all have large stacks of cash. I think you'll see that push to the next having. So as far as mining stocks, I think you'll see them sag here and then kind of flatline throughout the rest of the year. As far as Bitcoin price in general, it'll probably follow a similar trend. You know, I, I'm targeting throughout the rest of this year, it'll sag and then probably trade flat until the weather turns cold again. And then we'll likely see another big run up like we have in previous havings. Sounds good. Now you're talking about mining fees and things like that. It's all kind of related, but I mean, if you look at the fees to confirm a transaction on, on, you know, and you look at the mempool, right? You know, kind of like we're talking in the kind of 30, like high 30s to, to mid 40s, uh, SAP per byte, which is still pretty high, right? I mean, I, I think in a, in a lot of ways. And, um, you know, there's still tens of thousands of unconfirmed transactions on the, um, you know, on, on, in the mempool. So, I mean, it's not like in the, ordin in the days of era of ordinal hype. But, uh, um, you know, the, the math of pipe where things were like 60 plus sats per V-byte or more, and took really, it was really difficult to confirm transactions, but, you know, we're not seeing fees come down. So, you know, I, I mean, I, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on that. Uh, and we'll, Joe, we'll get you in as well. Yeah, you know, I, I think in general, you're starting to see uh, the Bitcoin base layer uh, mature in a way. Uh, over time, fees will have to increase for that the the mining, mining economics and therefore the security budget of Bitcoin to kind of hold steadfast as it as it needs to be. Um, you're seeing a lot of people moving to layer two things like lightning uh, and using some altcoins for payments as well. So I think you'll see that trend kind of continue um, as lightning and liquid and these other uh, layer two payment channels start to ramp up things like Fediment, uh, Chami and eCash, those kinds of things. Uh, those things are starting to develop more and more. So I think it's it's going as intended in order for the block sub subsidy to half either the price of Bitcoin has to go way up uh, and a mix of transaction fees have to go up in order to make mining economical. And so I, I, you're seeing a large uh, influx uh, to lightning and liquid. And I think you'll, you'll continue to see that um, as the halvings progress. That's really cool, Joe. Um, what do you think? I mean, what do you think of this kind of dichotomy between, okay, Bitcoin falling, mining being impacted, right? You know, like the, the equity in mining companies um, and then the actual Unconfirmed, the unconfirmed transactions and the transaction fees still being relatively high. It's almost like we're recreating the world of, you know, uh, you know, the kind of world that we live in now, where prices are going up, but you know, everyone's like, what's what, what's happening to prices? So, uh, what's happening in my wealth uh, relative to prices? But Joe, I would love to get your yeah. thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, I look at it just as a repeat, right? I feel like everything just repeats. Like I, I've been in this since 2012. The reason why I said the ETF wasn't wasn't going to create a a price increase is because we have mid-cycle tops three months before halvings every single cycle. Um, we hit the 0.618 and then we come down 20, 30%. And this just repeats over and over and over. Fees fluctuate. We get these like incredible, insanely high fees. And then things kind of level out and get fixed. Like this is just a repeat of what we've seen every single time. And what we just hit was a mid-cycle top. Um, fees are reacting the same way they did before. It's just always, it really is. I know it's not supposed to be indicative of the future, but it has been. And I, I think you just need to accept that. And even in October, the reason why I love Bitcoin is because it is the most transparent asset. We saw incredible inflows in October and the price was not moving. And we were discussing, will we see 35,000 again before the halving? And I'm like, of course we will. We see the inflows, right? And we saw the inflows to the ETF. It's one of the, it, it is the best ETF launch ever. Um, yeah, there's outflows, but if you, there's more inflows than outflows at the moment. This will catch up. Scarcity will build and we'll have another, we'll have another run. It's just, it's just part of the cycle. That's pretty cool. Awesome. Uh, Powell and uh, Sarah. 
we'd love to get your thoughts in this space. We'll let you all, you all jumping in. Hey, hi, can you hear me? Yeah, can you okay, okay yeah. perfect. So, so uh, my thoughts was, uh, are like, uh, like from the very beginning before the uh, all Bitcoin ETF uh, approval happened, uh, was that, uh, that it will go down because of a couple of reasons. Like uh, one of the main reasons was that, that all those ETF issuers were buying Bitcoin since 2017. And we're buying this not because they, you know, believed about the Bitcoin or something, you know, around the cryptocurrency and, and blockchain. They are buying this because after the ETF approval, approval they were able to uh, move uh, those assets, the Bitcoins, from their own packet to another packet, from the treasury they had uh, to, the, uh, um, uh, to the treasury for the, uh, that, that was baking actually the, the, the Bitcoin ETF. And, uh, Giving that uh, together with a with couple of uh, elements that, that was like in terms of grayscale uh, fee 1.5%. So everyone was, you know, moving out and uh, shares of, of the um, grayscale Bitcoin ETF that were sell, sold like a year ago or, or even before on the discounted rate. So, so that was obvious that this, this kind of dump will, will happen. But um, I, I was analyzing the in, inflows of capital like a week ago, and basically the amount of capital that is floating into the uh, ETF, the, the Bitcoin ETF space, is right now around like 20, 25 times bigger than the daily uh, than the daily uh, mining uh, in, uh, of, of Bitcoins through through the miners. So that means that if this, you know, um, uh, if, if those factors... But then, Paul, how, how come we're not seeing that reflected in prices then? Uh, That's true. I mean, I'd love to see the numbers. That's yeah, the, so, so, so know, one, one, sounds stark. one reason is like, like yesterday we seen a 1 billion dump from, from uh, by, by FTX. Uh, uh, so they sold all the uh, GBTC shares worth uh, around 1 billion. Um, uh, the, another reason is that a lot of uh, GBTC shares has been sold on the discounted rate long ago and, and people were just cashing out because the discount was, was big enough and the Bitcoin was on a good, on the good price. Another one is that they have a big treasuries in terms of Bitcoin. So they don't need to buy this from the spot market because they have enough right now to cover all the capital inflows, but this will end eventually. So once it ends, then we will see a huge, in my opinion, we will see a huge uh, supply crunch. And that will be the moment when the Bitcoin will skyrocket and we will see a, a, a bull run like we never saw. And that's my opinion. Uh, based on the numbers and on the facts that you can track, you know, so so that. What kind of net inflows? If you were to approximate, if you were to take out the treasuries that people like or the what people are holding, yep. what do you think the net inflows on a daily basis would be uh, into the into the asset class? Like twenty twenty five thousand. I was checking like a uh, couple of days ago before the Davos, so it was like twenty twenty five thousand. Uh, bitcoins a day uh, in terms of inflows uh, and the mining uh, or daily mining on the uh, on the on the mining side was like 900 and together with halving we're going to be decreased by 50 percent so that might even accelerate that growth uh, that that uh, in, in in that market you know um, so so uh, so yeah uh, and yeah one of those treasuries if are, you have any numbers yeah Oh, by the way, I think that's great. If you have numbers, so I had, I can send you, know, you those numbers. Are interesting the numbers. I'd be, yeah, yeah. I'm, I mean, not even after. Feel free to post it up in the nest. I think everyone here in the okay, audience yeah. would be curious to take a look, including myself. And also, a note, a note to the audience: there's a purple button on the lower right. Feel free to to click it, and um, you know, feel free to have comments. We have a team on the back end looking at stuff. If you have comments, so we'll bring you up. We'll read out the comments. So, uh, so yeah, I'd like to move on to um, to Seraphim and. Uh, Info space by the gorilla. Uh, shout out to gorilla uh, DeFi. If you want to jump in any time, just let us know. But gorilla DeFi is, uh, you know, our, our partner for today, uh, and we have a lot of things to talk about in terms of their AMA later in the space. But gorilla, feel free to jump in whenever you want. But in the meantime, Seraphim and Info Space, uh, what do you think about all these interesting stats that were shared and thoughts that were shared? Yeah, guys covered the stuff pretty well, but generally, I feel like the market was bound to, to correct a little bit. If you looked at before the 1st of Jan, the funding rate on being long Bitcoin and Ethereum was like 30% annualized. You'd be like earning a shit ton of money with your classic long spot short perp trade. And that just showed that the market was overextended too quickly. Um, and actually these track fire events like ETFs and CME futures, they tend to be the tops. 
if you remember last cycle or two cycles, we had a CME futures listing that was literally the top of the market. I think these events kind of are very often marking exactly the top and it's completely normal after the market was so overextended. So I expect it to go down a little bit and then just, uh, you know, crack on going up after that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, can you, um, you know, we're about to talk about DeFi and stuff, but can you talk a little bit more about the long spot, a uh, short perp? Um, can you talk a bit about the trade and how it's evolved over time? Yeah, so it's been a very popular trade where you basically take Bitcoin and then you hedge it by shorting Bitcoin futures or Bitcoin perps. And that way you're kind of delta hedged, but you're earning the funding rate on the Bitcoin side and in funding in environments like bull markets before the 1st of Jan, you have incredible funding rates. You have 30 to 40% annualized rates just by holding uh, your delta neutral exposure. And that trade has been put on like in pretty decent size across the years. It's one of the most basic trades. Um, it's being done in Ethereum too. Um, and uh, yeah, it fluctuates depending on, like, it can go negative in bear markets. Uh, we've seen negative environments like last quarter, uh, last year during the merge. Um, but it tends to be on average like plus 15% yearly or so. If you want to do this in a, in a pure DeFi way, there's actually not, a, not easy ways for people in America. I don't know, I don't know where you are, by the way. So, uh, uh, but I'm just saying for folks in America, it's like DYDX, great, uh, you know, derivatives um, exchange based in Brooklyn, New York, but uh, no American can actually use it. So they they basically service the entire world except their own country. Um, but uh, but yeah, I mean, of course, there's some C5 ways to do it. Yeah, in DeFi, you can do it, I guess, because uh, DeFi is permissionless. You can't use the, the UI, but I'm sure there's a way to go around it. Um, but generally, yeah, when it comes to C5, I don't think there's a very kind of a viable way to short perps uh, for Americans. But, um, but I do know a lot of American, like, entities doing that, but they have to have an offshore legal structure. Yeah, they have to have so. offshore. They have to have, they have to have offshore. At least other than now, we'll see. We'll see. But yeah, yeah. very cool. As info space, you want to jump in? Talk about hey, man. Uh, Jim, Jim. Um, wonderful space. Okay, so, um, DeFi in 2024, we, we've seen a bit of downside in the market, and then that should be expected, considering the fact that we've had a very beautiful run uh from the lows of last year to um, a, new, a new local ETH right now. And then the fact that the Bitcoin ETF, um, okay, in my opinion, there were two catalysts for the downside we are seeing in the market. The first being the fact that the Bitcoin ETF approval was actually by the rumors of the news event because people were anticipating the, the, the approval quite early. Right. A lot of people were bidding on Bitcoin and other tokens. And then these people were bound to take short term profits when the when, when approval happened. And that was what led to that. And also, um, the great scale BTC sell off aside, we know uh, if you follow the past cycles, Three months before the, or some months before Bitcoin Alvin, Alvin, which is expected to come up in April this year, um, the market reaches like a lookout top, and then there's like a sell off before it resumes. However, I believe the, the, the market this year, the fire generally is in good spirit, and then we should be looking forward to some constructive growth, especially concerning the fact that new techs are coming into the space. We are seeing, um, we are seeing Ethereum roll up, uh, roll out proto dunk shading, and then we are seeing modular protocols coming up. A lot of a lot of new techs are uh, coming to the space, and then financial wise, I think a lot of new money will come into the space with the um, ETF because uh, this allow allow for tokenization, bond stocks, treasuries, um, reward assets will, would come into the space. People would roll out um, ETFs for their projects, and then. I think I think I think uh, a lot of new money will come into the space. Uh, we have two projects. Uh, we've seen the fact that Samsung and some other protocols in the in the recent past are partnering with Web three projects. This is this is this is um, a good um, a good foundation for growth in, in for yeah. the five projects in twenty twenty four. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think you're laying out some some great things. Thank you, thank you for that. Um, Gunny, we'll, we'll move on to you, but um, actually, we're gonna just shift gears to uh, talking about DeFi specifically. We've already kind of have done that, but before we shift those gears, want to uh, do a shout out. Uh, uh, if you look up at the Nest, uh, we actually pinned, um, please feel free to join our Telegram group. We've got a newsletter. We encourage comments on the purple button on the lower right. And of course, a big shout out to uh, our partner for today, Gorilla DeFi. Gorilla DeFi being a groundbreaking layer one blockchain, unique proof of engagement consensus mechanism. Uh, we will be going into, the, going into that in a Q&A in a little bit. Uh, Gorilla, did you want to talk a little bit about that? We, we have your Q&A in the last 15 minutes, but right now we're going to talk about DeFi generally. 
So if you thought about DeFi as, as a market uh, and some of the trends, this would be a great time to jump in. Yeah. Hi, EYC. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you? Yeah, pretty well. Uh, today was a launch. Uh, was uh, pretty uh, going well. The Polygon Matic uh, itself was uh, completely jammed because of Gorilla D5. So we are just back again uh, 10 minutes before. And uh, yeah, we have just started right now uh, with uh, Gorilla D5 uh, along with the blockchain project that uh, we are coming up with that is layer one that is uh, on the proof of engagement consensus. Um, usually the blockchains are uh, proof of uh, staking but uh, we have something very unique uh, uh, blockchain uh, that is uh, coming where both, both the content creators as well as the community gets rewarded. Usually uh, in the web 2 or the web 3, um, you know, usually uh, only the content creators get rewarded. But uh, here with the, you know, the POE uh, proof of engagement consensus, uh, both uh, the community as well as the c content creators get rewarded. And uh, moreover, we are uh, coming up with our uh, Crypt God uh, social media platform that will be exclusively for uh, crypto community. Usually now the all the you know the uh, mm -hmm. you know the community is very fragmented along uh, uh, you know Twitter, Telegram, and uh, Reddit everywhere. We want to build a social media platform exclusively for uh, crypto uh, community people that will be based on the uh, our blockchain that will be on the POE consensus. Yeah, that's great. Um, thank you. We'll we'll get to the poll Q and A. There's a lot, a lot to unpack there. Um, but uh, yeah, let's let's kind of bring it up to the high level and talk about. Um, we're excited to do so, by the way. But Gareth, um, maybe you could give us a, uh, uh, give the audience just a kind of a, a generalization of like what's happening with DeFi, right? Um, you know, I think people generally know roughly what DeFi is, but maybe not doesn't know what's what's been the latest. Yeah. So, so yeah. oh, sorry, was was that directed to me? That uh, okay. To so, so just to be fair, I am by no means an expert. I'm a chart guy and uh, a technician of the charts. So, so I would, I'm sure there are much better people in here to to be able to answer that. All right, sounds good. Joe, maybe Joe or some others, do you want to talk a little bit more about it? Yeah, I mean, if, look, in DeFi, there's there's a couple shifts, right? Like um, Solana, thanks to Sam Bankman Free, was very much positioned as a DeFi protocol. Today, we've seen that they, they really never got a whole lot of TVL and kind of started shifting into what they're doing. Uh, I'm excited to see that there's a lot of DeFi that will be launched on Bitcoin. I'm really curious as to how much that's going to, how much that's going to grow. Uh, I'm oh, on tell the theory. us a bit more about that. Wait, more. Okay, yeah. Tell us a bit more about that. I'd love to hear what you mean by that. Yeah, I mean DeFi basically the whole DeFi ecosystem built up on ETH. Imagine it being built up on on Bitcoin, and that's that's what's happening. That's that's launching in the next few months. Several protocols will be doing that. And it, I would assume it'll have more TVL or the total value locked than any other chain simply because it's the biggest chain already. Um, and that creates a whole different uh, DeFi world than the one I think we're used to, which is quite small in all reality when you compare it to any, any other uh, big financial instrument in the world. Um, and I think we're going to start seeing that, that I know of. I know next month, two months, there's going to be a lot of token launches that are, you know, Bitcoin concentrated around the Bitcoin ecosystem and, and building that out uh, that I'm excited to see. Um, again, don't forget, you know, there was a lot of mistakes. There's a lot of uh, things that happen when things get built on Ethereum. The same thing will also happen on Bitcoin. Well, are you talking about like BRC twenty? Are you specifically talking about BRC twenty? Like what's happening with the ordinals or with layer two? I'm like, talking about every. I'm yeah. talking about borrowing and lending. I'm talking about swapping. I'm talking about uh, coins that launch like BRC twenty uh, tokens um, that launch. I'm talking about the whole ecosystem that you've seen between like you, you know Uniswap and Aave and, and and everything else being built out on block on uh, on. Uh, I can't believe it, I just forgot the name. On on um, uh, Bitcoin. That's pretty incredible. Yeah, I guess we'll we'll, we'll see where, where things go. I mean, Gunny. Yeah, roll, roll ups, ZK roll ups, reducing fee. I mean, Lightning kind of already did. I think we'll have better examples than Lightning, but we will see. I think so. Good, Gunny. Let's bring you into the conversation, Gunny. What, uh, hey, what do you think of, of what's happening with DeFi? Yeah, I, you know, I 
I've been a core contributor and builder in DeFi for going on um, close to four years now. And so I've seen a, a really uh, interesting evolution of it. Um, we, you know, my, my end of it has been mostly focused on Hero, which is, um, which is infrastructure, uh, you know, on-chain exchange for, that powers uh, trading applications and betting applications through its protocols. Um, on Solana, I, I wasn't quite sure what that comment from Joe was um, about Solana. It, it actually has had, you know, obviously went through um, a rough patch with what happened with with uh, with Sam Bankman Fried, but but um, you know has definitely, uh, I would say, has turned the ship in a in a in a big and meaningful way. And if, and if you kind of think about like where DeFi is going, I I think that while you know it is largely a very it, it is still driven heavily by speculation. There's no doubt about it. And um, things like borrow lend, which help facilitate speculation, um, there there is a little bit more of a sensitivity to um, to throughput and speed and um, and fees. I think I think much like you you know how we saw uh, the traditional financial system evolve over um, you know a hundred plus years. Um, uh, things happen kind of at the speed of light in, in crypto and, uh, you know, things like fee compression and throughput are things that something like Solana, uh, and, and there's some other blockchains that are, that are EVM compatible, that are, that are more EVM compatible, that are, that are coming to market some L1s that I think are going to pose, uh, interesting alternatives as well, um, to build these, these, uh, these financial Lego blocks that that require ultra low fees and uh, high throughput, um, like Solana does, and uh, you know we we've been building there because of the infrastructure that we're building, which is very much akin to an on-chain version of like CME uh, in many ways in terms of risk and and settlement clearing and whatnot. Uh, and in order to do that, um, you do need to have ultra high throughput. And uh, and low fees, and I think that a lot of what we're going to see in terms of speculation is going to drive into those um, those DApps and protocols that are built on top of blockchains that can facilitate that. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, can, I, can I just clarify what I was doing? Yeah, no yeah a, a gunny, no offense. It's just Solana has like one billion in TVL. ETH has thirty one. We were already mm -hmm. at one billion prior, and we were expecting it to go way higher. And it never got there. Like I was also on Solana chain. I, I, I get it. Yeah. It just we were supposed to be a lot higher than we are, and they've kind of shifted sure. to more like uh, different types of apps. The, a lot more of the art, the gaming, uh, which doesn't sure. involve DeFi as much. That's all. Yeah. No, I I, I hear you. And look, at I we're we're all we're all in a in an experimental phase. And and as you said, um, which I agree with is. Uh, TBL, first of all, TBL, but let me just say, like, I don't think when it comes to things that require high trans, uh, transaction uh, throughput fees and also um, uh, capital efficiency, TBL is not necessarily the best metric. It may be a little bit of a vanity metric in many ways. Um, but uh, that said, if you just take the entirety of, you know, whether it's Ethereum, any any L, Ethereum L two, Solana, uh, BRC twenty, anything, it, it still is is tiny. It's still like a kind of a pimple on the ass of an elephant um, relative to traditional finance. So um, we're 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 all in an experimental phase here, and I, I think we're going to see that for many more years. And um, you know, I, the only thing that you know, asking about what I'm seeing in 2024, I do think that you're going to see a little bit bigger of a push. So you know. If if Solana TVL is at 1.2 billion now, you know if it's if it's at 10 billion by the end of the year, if it's at 20 billion, it, it, it I think it's partially dependent uh, again because TVL maybe is not the best metric, especially when you're you know if you're dealing with things that that are talking about like like uh, margin based infrastructure protocols, like it, it becomes about capital efficiency. And, 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 and I, think, not I think Kenny makes a good point. Because um, yeah. you know the market cap of Bitcoin right now is still stuff one trillion, and there's definitely other asset classes out there that that, that dwarf it and kind of put it in a very uh, specific way, uh, which is very colorful. Thank you for doing that. Uh, sure. But uh, I'd like to hear Powell and 
Seraphim come in um, on this back and forth. Uh, curious about where, where you stand on this. Yeah, so so uh, like my my point of view, like is uh, we see all those regulations stepping in and jumping in into the crypto. Like Nika Dora DLT just mentioned those three that are you know tackling the European crypto market and states they have their own that they're working on Asians. They have uh, their own. We have VADA regulation in the UAE. So like we see it, that market is shifting towards regulation. So that's one fact. And we see also that together with that, um, a big new market is going to be brought to the crypto, which is named RWA's tokenization of uh, real world assets. And this is highly needed from my perspective. Why? Because right now, imagine we have those, for example, DeFi protocols, which are over, collater over collateralized DeFi protocols. You borrow Bitcoin, you provide Ethereum. And uh, uh, like this is, in my opinion, wrong by design because we should have different class of assets in crypto. Right now, we are securing one crypto with another. We borrow Bitcoin, we provide Ethereum as collateral. Bitcoin goes down and every year we see those big headlines, massive liquidations in crypto. Uh, people are losing millions of dollars because of Bitcoin going down, etc. It's not because of that, because we secure one asset of the same class with another asset of the same class. So, speaking of which, this LWA, so real asset market, will uh, bring, in my opinion, a amazing, tremendously big liquidity to the crypto, and those uh, will this will allow us to create a completely new, uh, complicated or easy, uh, but completely new wave of DeFi protocols that are based on real yield made on traditional market, and this is going to be a combination of those two, and this is also something that you know, Larry Fink is shouting all all around that you know, uh, tokenization is a saver of the financial market. Uh, because right now, imagine like you want to buy stocks or something you can trade like uh, from Monday to Friday, from nine to five. Like why do they shut down internet? No, like because like those are some old legacy systems, some regulations. But in crypto, with tokenization even of alternative assets like real estate uh, uh, itself or just APY from real estate, you can create a completely new crazy things. And this is also what we do at, at Nomad, like we are tokenizing hedge funds, APY from the hedge funds, fully regulated, this and that. And I believe this is going to be a next big thing in 2024 and five, together with the regulations, together, together with the liquidity. Uh, and uh, the combination of this plus crypto protocols might bring uh, like really, really interesting results. So, yeah, so I think that this is going to be mm -hmm. the next super interesting element of the DeFi market. Wow, that's a, I mean, there's so much to unpack there. We could almost run several spaces on, on just that. But uh, of course, time is uh, time is time. And actually, right now is the time uh, for us to move right into Gorilla DeFi and uh, the, uh, the pitch in the Q&A. So um, to tee you up, Gorilla DeFi, uh, Gorilla DeFi leverages a proof, proof of engagement consensus to create a decentralized ecosystem that generously rewards content creators and actively engages the community. Um, so, and uh, the goal is about inclusivity and participation from at least what I understand uh, from some of the uh, information I got in advance. But Gorilla, do you want to talk a little bit about uh, your project? And then, well, of course, we'd be happy to have a Q&A. And uh, for the rest of the panel, feel free to tee up your questions. Yes, of course. So, um, like, you know, I've been um, listening to all the conversations that were happening right now around the DeFi space. <clears throat> so before jumping on to the project directly, so I would also uh, like, you know, love to add the fact that, yes, of course, um, like, you know, since the past, um, like, you know, couple of years, it's been, um, like, you know, multiple cycles, right? And there have been multiple, uh, like, skepticism around the, like, you know, whole DeFi space, right? And that's why the market has been, um, like, I don't know, like, how to, how to put it out there, <clears throat> but very, um, like, you know, funny in that sense, right? So, like, you know, that's why, um, like, you know, when we talk about the Gorilla DeFi and, um, like, you know, we ourselves have been VCs, right? And we have been investing in multiple projects, right? And we've seen the, uh, like, you know, ups and downs in this whole market very closely. So that's why, um, like, you know, before la launching our own layer one protocol, layer one blockchain, <coughs> we actually are coming up, like, you know, we actually came up with this new type of a pre-sale, wherein the, the idea of this pre-sale is very investor centric. Right. So what do I mean by that is in the pre-sale itself, every investor who invests in our uh, token, right, of course, they will be part of the whole uh, God chain ecosystem that is going to come up pretty soon. And they will be owners of the governance token, that is the God token itself. <coughs> but 
they also have the leverage to take an exit during the pre-sale itself, right? So that is something of uh, like you know USP that we are coming that we have come up with, right? Plus, um, like you know, there are some sort of staking rewards as well for people who would wanna like you know invest and stake their crypto during our pre-sale itself, and they get on some good amount of rewards as well. <clears throat> So, um, like, you know, as I mentioned before as well, regarding the God chain, that is the layer one blockchain that we are coming up with, is going to have a unique, uh, like, you know, consensus mechanism that is the proof of engagement, right? So, why proof of engagement? Why did we choose that? The only thing is that <clears throat> we've been seeing this thing for very long now that, um, like, you know, most of the projects are majorly either focusing upon the creators, either in Web3, either in Web2, <clears throat> or, um, like, you know, are just, um, like, you know, maybe, like, monetization-centric. So, we just wanted to come up with a, like, you know, platform or, a, like, you know, protocol, wherein the community as well is uh, incentivized pretty well, just to contribute with their engagement and all that stuff, right? So, that's why uh, this new consensus of uh, proof of engagement and also this new, um, like, you know, layer one protocol that we are coming up with. So this is the whole project and this is the whole plan about it. I think it's really interesting. So um, I mean, you, laid out, you laid out a lot of things. So one of the things I'm curious about is, you know, in the landscape of DeFi pre-sales, what kind of challenges are, I mean, you talked a little bit about this, but I'm curious about what challenges you're looking to address. <laughs> so the major challenge, um, like, you know, what we've seen, like, you know, our whole group has seen in the past is that, um, like, you know, a lot of people invest in the, like, you know, maybe IDOs or <clears throat> invest via multiple launch pads, right? So most of the times, um, like, you know, the, either the project takes too long to get listed or the project might, um, like, you know, there is always a skepticism that the project might run away, right? <laughs> so that's why, um, like, you know, we wanted to keep it super investor centric over here. And we wanted every investor to feel that, um, like, you know, sense of security, right? And actually try to get an exit directly during the pre-sale itself. So how does that, uh, how does that work is we have created our own, like, you know, marketplace that is called IDOQS, right? So what does IDOQS does is, like, you know, if you go to the platform right now, you purchase the God token, that is the native token, right? And either you can stake it on some staking rewards right or what you can do is you can directly sell it off right in our marketplace itself and the like you know consensus as well as the whole um, like you know protocol is designed in such a way that it will always be um, like you know in a first come first serve uh, basis wherein every new investor who comes into our protocol will be purchasing 50% from the IDOQS and 50% from the like you know from the whole token pool and everything is mentioned clearly in our website as well as in our white paper as well. Yeah, so actually on your um, Gorilla DeFi app right now and uh, looking, at, looking at sort of some of the trading and, and things like that, can you walk, the, maybe, you know, anyone who's interested in participating in sort of the best ways to look at this and also what kind of... Um, what kind of, sorry, I'm back. Uh, what kind of uh, uh, mechanisms are you using here? And because uh, I see a lot of penny transactions and things like that so that's on ETH. Um, you know, things like that, it, it's much faster, but I'd love to hear um, how, like, are you using an automated market maker and them or something else? So, so currently we are, um, like, you know, not using, a, uh, not using any sort of a market maker at the moment at our, on our pre-sale. So what is happening at the platform as of now is it's all community driven. And once, a, like, you know, <clears throat> once any individual comes to the platform, they just have to enter the application, right? And, um, like, you know, they are able to directly, um, like, you know, swap their USDC to God token, right? And once they do that, at that time itself, they get the option. Either, like, you know, on the, like, if you are on the platform right now, you can see on the top right corner, there are, there are three total, um, like, you know, options that you could go to. One is the marketplace, one is the staking, and the other is affiliate, right? So if you go to the staking, you can directly stake your God tokens and earn a, like, you know, daily return of over 0.9%. So, like, today itself, we launched it out, and right now we have over, um, like, you know, 40 stakers, like, you know, four zero, and people are staking on our platform currently as well. I, I think it's super cool. And kind of what's the underlying technology uh, here that's being utilized? Sorry, I, I didn't get your question. I, I guess yeah, I, I had some the, information. Yeah. yeah, just what's the underlying technology? Like, what's your tech stack? I'd love for you to just talk through what your tech stack is. So, currently, currently the protocol is based upon Polygon uh, Matic POS, right? And, yeah, I mean, this is a, like, you know, 
decentralized staking platform itself directly. Yeah. I think it's really cool. I think it's really cool. And by the way, if any of the rest of the panel have questions or uh, you and the audience have questions, feel free to uh, put them in the uh, lower right with the purple uh, button. So um, maybe kind of giving, um, you know, kind of looking out at uh, sort of the broader sort of ecosystems. Um, how do you think, you know, proof of engagement, right? This this what you're yeah. calling proof of engagement consensus mechanism. How do you think it differentiates itself? And you talked a little bit about this, right? But maybe let's dive a little deeper into, into what uh, what that means. Yes, of course. So, proof of engagement, as the name suggests, um, like, you know, we are going to track the engagement via, uh, like, you know, multiple uh, these things, like, you know, the community as well as the users. So, like, you know, think of this scenario. <clears throat> tomorrow, if we, uh, like, you know, if, if tomorrow itself we are going to launch our uh, blockchain, right? So, tomorrow we launch Godchain. And on that platform, uh, like, you know, whatever the project will be built upon, like, you know, any social five platform or any game five platform that will be built upon the God chain, right? It is going to have multiple users, right? So all the users who are going to, um, like, you know, interact with the, the creators or the games or any sort of a brand, right? So the users will also get incentivized via the, um, like, you know, the platform or the protocol based upon their engagement percentage so how does it work is i'll i'll tell you in a very <clears throat> very decent way so like you know let's consider like you know twitter itself so uh, on twitter there are um, like you know multiple creators and influencers right so everybody who gets paid by a brand or any sort of a like you know maybe a company or anything right so they can actually set up some sort of an incentivization that will be um, like you know led by a smart contract Right, and that smart contract will anonymously, uh, like you know, incentivize all the users and their community who will engage it with the most, um, like you know, most relevant manner out there. So, like you know, just to attract more and more users via incentivization. Plus, you'll also get some good sort of, um, like you know, engagement out there on the platform itself. I, I think it sounds great. Um, how do you? So, you know, part of the part of the game here, of course, um, with you know, launching these kinds of things is. You know, securing listings on reputable reputable exchanges and uh, and the overall thing of ensuring sustained growth, right? Uh, after you launch, so there's a lot of excitement and hype, and then things launch, and then you know there's not a lot of sustainment to your to your point. So, what's um, how do you plan to secure those listings and also sustain engagement? Are you talking about the uh, yeah? Are, are you talking about the uh, like the God token listing? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, <laughs> so like you know, in the pre itself, once we are um, like you know done with minting all the like you know 650 million tokens, and so like you know 650 million is a scary number <laughs> initially for the pre sale, but but it also consists of all the rewards that we are gonna give out in the like you know staking as well as all the rewards for airdrops, etc. Right. So once the 650 million benchmark is achieved, we are aiming at just um, like you know three months from now. Right. So after three months itself, we are gonna be listed on multiple exchanges, and the list of the exchanges will be out in the next month itself. So currently we are not actually uh, giving out the list, right? But yeah, like you know, like by the end of next month, that is end of Feb. At that time, we are gonna um, like you know, like give out the list of all the exchanges, tier one and tier two, all of them. Nice, that's great. That's super great. Um, and you know, and even you know, getting on list on Coin Market Cap is is a difficulty in and of itself, right? Just uh, just being on that list, right? Um, even though there's supposed to be an aggregator. And uh, have you encountered that before too, either with this project or other projects? Sorry, I lost you again. Can you please repeat uh, after the CMC? What did you say? No, no, no coin, the coin market. By the way, is my audio cutting in and out? Or um, uh, I was talking about coin market cap, right? The aggregators. Yeah. Right? These aggregators is actually difficult to uh, to actually get in, which is uh, interesting, right? In and so. Yeah, I mean, yeah, like, you know, we are already in talks with them, with uh, CMC itself, CoinMarketCap, right? And we are going to go to them itself for the first time, and then we'll be uh, on CoinGecko, etc. But yeah, for the first time, we'll go to CMC itself. Yeah, how are those conversations, by the way, with CMC and CoinGecko, just in general, right? Because, like, there's so many projects out there, right? How do you, how do you get above the fray? <clears throat> so yeah, like you know, they also have their own due diligence processes, um, like you know, listed out there, and we are um, like you know in very um, like you know forward conversations right now. We are already um, like you know in touch with their um, like you know growth people as well as their partnership teams, right? And we are gonna be listed over there pretty soon itself. So I mean, yeah, that is going on. Okay, that's really cool. That's really good to hear. Yeah. Yes. Um, so, how do you address? So, this has been on and off with DeFi, but there's been a lot of community safety concerns, right? 
and you see it in existing protocols, you see it in existing communities. How do you okay. plan to address some of those safety concerns uh, for users to users along your platform? Yeah, so um, to be very honest, our USP over here is not just a protocol design as well as the roadmap, but we also have um, like, you know, one more thing. So, um, like, you know, the project is audited by Hacken. All the three things are token plus the staking, um, like, you know, staking protocol as well as our marketplace. That is the ID OQS. Everything is already uh, audited by Hacken, right? Plus, um, like, you know, other than that, we are a fully documented uh, company and also, uh, like, you know, we, the founders are not, uh, like, you know, hiding away, right, even if it is a decentralized project. But yeah, like, you know, we have done, um, like, you know, multiple KYCs as well as we are openly available on uh, LinkedIn as well as on Telegram. So every detail is also available on the, web, uh, on the website as well. So anybody can directly reach out to us and in case they have any sort of a problem or anything because we are not hiding away being a you know, decentralized project so like you know the community has that trust now because of the auditing via hacken plus our um, like you know kyc is being done on multiple grounds i think it sounds good i mean unless someone else has any other questions what would you like to leave uh, the audience with um girl at defi what would you like to have them take away from this conversation yeah, so I mean, uh, what we are essentially trying to do over here is we are um, like, you know, trying to change the way decentralized sector works over here, right? Because decentralization doesn't, um, like, you know, have to actually mean that, um, like, you know, you need to be hiding away somewhere, but it's also about gaining the trust and, um, like, you know, providing the security to the topmost level, right? Plus being audited by, um, like, you know, Hacken as well as, um, like, you know, fully being out there in the market and also, like, you know, being a very investor centric, um, like, you know, protocol, even in the pre-sale, we just want to, um, like, you know, how do I say gain the trust of the investors again, gain the trust of the, uh, like, you know, general public again and bring them up to the, like, you know, whole DeFi sector and the decentralization sector since the bull market is also, um, like, you know, coming up with the Bitcoin halving and all, right? So, I mean, yeah, like, you know, this is the whole goal of it that we want to revolutionize and provide this um, aspect and the perspective from our side that, okay, this is also a way wherein the decentralization of the DeFi sector can work up. I think it's pretty incredible. I think you presented a lot of new ideas, uh, novel ways, and um, congratulations on all the great progress. I'm looking forward to seeing your progress over the months and the years uh, as wild yeah. ride and as sure. crypto continues. So thank you very much. Um, thanks to the whole audience. We really, really appreciate you all joining. Please feel free to uh, join our Telegram group, our uh, newsletter. Please follow Gorilla DeFi, follow what they're doing, and uh, follow all the other great speakers we've had here. Um, we do these very regularly all the time, so look forward to seeing you on the next one. Thanks, everybody. Take care.